Today's presenter is Ray Machado. Ray joined Alliant Insurance Services last year and brings his experience in manufacturing, where he managed safety training for a staff of over 1,000 employees. Ray is a graduate of California State University, Northridge, and holds a Bachelor of Science in Environmental and Occupational Health. He is an Associate Safety Professional, a designation through the Board of Certified Safety Professionals. I would now like to turn the program over to Ray. All right, thank you for the lovely uh, introduction, Christy. And to get this started, I'll start it off by posting our uh, Alliant Risk Control Disclaimer, simply stating that we're not you know, covering all um, risks or damages uh, that could happen through what the, web, uh, the title of the, the webinar, and we're not guaranteeing that you know, these risks or, or damages can be avoided simply by, by watching the, the webinar. And some of the learning objectives that we'll be covering today, we'll review the different types of flammable classes. There's a, a couple uh, different ones that, that we'll be discussing. We'll be able to identify flammable liquids and hazards associated with flammable liquids and compressed gases. Also identifying safe use and storage practices. We'll be reviewing best practices for managing these hazards. And in the end, um, you know, there's always the after trying to minimize all uh, chances of hazards or risks, there's always the uh, you know, small um, chance that an emergency can happen, so we'll be covering emergency response procedures. And the course outline, again, uh, you know, in line with uh, learning objectives, so looking at different flammables and flammable classes, um, different types of flammable hazards, different storage and safe use practices, preventive measures, and emergency planning and ending it off with uh, a summary. So why care? Why should we, you know, uh, even attend this, this webinar? Why should we care about potential flammable um, hazards within our workplace? Well, for one, you know, they present a, a huge danger to personal injury and property damage, um, you know, if these events were to happen or if uh, certain hazards aren't mitigated or managed properly by your facility. And they're so that they're also required by law, and they're also required by, by OSHA standards. Although you know some of these um, hazards can be low probability, sometimes they are by far you know very high risk when when uh, incident involving a flammable hazard or explosion occurs. So uh, a couple of examples. Um, I'm sure we've seen a lot of of these, whether you know, at work or in our personal life. Um, I know myself, you know, barbecuing on the weekends, um, dealing frequently with uh, propane gas tanks, or whether it could be driving a forklift at work or managing employees that drive forklifts at, at work. You know, what steps are, are taken to mitigate and manage hazards associated with those. Some others, of course, um, gas cans, whether we're transporting or transferring liquids into or, or out of gas cans. Other frequent ones that, you know, oftentimes we don't think about, especially, you know, when we're working on them or whether there's a maintenance shop that, that is working with them are aerosol cans or aerosol hazards, as well as paint thinners. And last but not least, um, thanks to, you know, the <laughs> current situation that we're all seen in, um, we've seen a, a huge upsurge of of hand sanitizer use. Um, there's a lot of you know smaller chemical manufacturing warehouses or plants that are you know now manufacturing sanitizer due to the you know increased demand for it, as well as certain companies that you know around are now you know um, purchasing you know larger containers of, of hand sanitizer and 55 gallon drums and dispensing into smaller um, sanitizer to dispense within their, their facilities. So yes, there um, are hazards uh, associated with, with hand sanitizers as well, even as, as common as, as it is, you know, seeing it in your, you know, everyday grocery store or, or everyday life. And before we, you know, really get into the, the presentation, I want to start off by going over some uh, definitions that, that are very key to, to the hazards that we'll be discussing. So there's, you know, flammable liquids and, and combustible liquids that, that we'll be discussing, more so going into flammable liquids. The two, you know, sometimes are used interchangeably, 
but their definitions are quite different. So a flammable liquid, this will have a flash point of less than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas a combustible liquid will have a flash point at or above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And the, the key difference in that, you know, if you think about a flash point of less than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, now we're looking at, you know, temperatures that can be in, in room temperature or below. So these are going to be much more, more frequent and, and much more dangerous just, you know, simply due to the lower flash point, uh, you know, lower point where the liquid can be ignitable at. And then gases. So since these are already in, you know, vapor form, the, uh, they are flammable in, in all standard conditions. So there's no, you know, temperature that is associated with, with gases and their flammability. And then I know we just discussed, discussed flash point. So flash point, that's the temperature where the liquid gives off enough vapor to form an ignitable mixture. And, you know, going into that, um, with these flammable liquids and combustible liquids, so it's not the actual liquid in itself that combusts or is able to ignite, it's the actual vapor. So once that chemical or that liquid reaches that, that flash point, at which point it starts releasing its, its vapor, you know, that's the point where the vapor could possibly combust, more so when it's in between the explosive range, so within its upper, upper explosive limit and, and lower explosive limit. And simply what that means is, you know, the first step is that that liquid has to reach that, that flash point. So then the vapors start emitting from the, the liquid. And once that, that vapor is within the explosive range, for example, you know, just jumping ahead into the next slide, so this is a, an SDS example of a generic hand sanitizer. And this is also attached within the, the, the handouts if you wish to, to have a copy of that. Um, so what that means is, you know, this generic hand sanitizer has a flash point of, of 40, 54 degrees Fahrenheit. So at 54 degrees Fahrenheit, it'll start emitting those, those vapors. And once that vapor concentration is between 3.3 and 19%, that's the, the range, the explosive limit range, where once it reaches that percentage of concentration in the air, um, it has the possibility of, of exploding. So as long as it's below um, the 3.3% or above the 19%, the it's either you know, uh, too saturated to burn or uh, not enough of the, of the vapor in, in concentration to, to be within that explosive range. And then uh, there's a couple different ways of hazards being classified. So one of them is through hazardous classified locations. Uh, the ones we'll be dealing with are class one, uh, more specifically class two. And essentially class one uh, hazardous locations are, or not class one, uh, division one uh, hazardous locations are those locations where the flammable gas or vapor is you know, readily available um, in the atmosphere. And when it's at a uh, division two, that means that it's not uh, ready, readily available in the atmosphere. It has to, it has potential of being available either through a, a leak, you know, a, if something goes wrong. For example, if your facility is storing propane tanks at a certain location, uh, that would be classified as a class one division two, uh, simply because those propane tanks are under control. You know, they're not uh, readily um, being let out in, into that into the atmosphere, they're, they're contained with that container. And the only way that they would be, you know, let out into the, the atmosphere is either through accidental release or someone, you know, going in and physically opening the, the valve to that. And then class two and class three, so those uh, discuss combustible dust and ignitable fibers. Uh, the same thing applies for them in regards to division one and division two, but we won't go into those for, for this presentation, just simply um, due to the, the focus of you know, looking into final gases and, and liquids. And then hazard classifications for, for flammable liquids. So then uh, NFPA puts its own flammable classifications on them uh, where they classify the flammable liquids with a 1A, 1B, or 1C, and then combustible liquids with a 2 or a 3A or 3B, also depending on the flash points and, and boiling points. Um, these aren't uh, 
it's not important to, to memorize these uh, at the moment. And here, this, these are the ones that we'll be talking uh, more so into. So looking at those flammable liquids. So as you can see, a flammable liquid will be either a category one or a category, category, category two. Um, it could also be category three, since it's between that 73 and 100, 140 degree Fahrenheit range. But that doesn't mean that all flammable liquids are within that range. Um, within the category three and category four, that's also where there's crossover and the combustible liquids. Um, some of them are categorized within that category three and others uh, fall within the, the category four. And really the, the key that we're looking here is the, the flash point range, you know, where they, they fall under. And then looking again at that SDS example that, uh, as I mentioned, is in the handout section. Um, as you can see, uh, within section two of the, of the SDS, it goes over flammable. Um, you can see the GHS classification. It's classified as a, as a category two. And later on, we'll be going over the, the flash point of the SDS to see exactly why it's categorized at that uh, as a category two flammable liquid. Great, so now going into you know possible flammable hazards, uh, what are the potential hazards? Um, some of these, you know, we may not think uh, once or twice about uh, in the workplace, um, but always, you know, we gotta keep in mind that these do have the, the potential to you know, a, a, a fire or, or lead to an explosion if proper care and, and maintenance is taken or the um, best practices aren't, aren't used when dealing or working with these substances. So compressed gases, uh, the main hazards, again, that we focus with are fires and explosions associated with these. These could be, um, you know, propane tanks or, or other um, tanks that have other um, gases with, within them. Aerosols, again, they have a you know, numerous uh, assortment of, of hazards. We'll maybe need to be looking into the, the flammability of them. And then here's an example of you know, an aerosol can, which, um, as you can see, it's a little uh, banged up, could have the potential to you know, release those contents into the, into the atmosphere, um, therefore having that, you know, that vapor concentration readily available and you know, having the, the risk of a of an explosion or, or a fire happening. And one of the main concerns with aerosols is that a lot of times, you know, in in, uh, in our work, um, in, in workspaces or, or workshops, you know, maintenance uh, departments, um, you know, when these employees are, are working on um, certain materials, uh, using either these for, for painting purposes or uh, degreasing purposes or whatever it may be, um, they leave the cans in the exact work area where they're working with them. And the uh, concern with that is, you know, they could be doing a, a sanding operation or, you know, some type of operation that emits sparks or other materials or um, emits higher uh, temperature. And with having these aerosol cans, you know, uh, readily at hand or within close proximity and those sparks flying, um, as you could imagine, you know, there's a the potential of the can heating up or of the can if it's you know a little bit banged up or if it tips over something happens where that could ignite and an accident can occur. Now another common one, LPG tanks or uh, liquid protein tanks. Um, some of the pictograms associated with these is the, the flammable pictogram and the compressed gas pictogram. And uh, the main concerns with these is that they're extremely uh, flammable gas and they contain gas under, under pressure, which may explode when, when heated. So um, proper care must be taken when, when managing and, and dealing with, uh, with uh, uh, propane tanks. Now looking at flammable hazards, some common combustible liquids include acetone, alcohol, turpentine, linseed oil. So these are you know, commonly used um, in workplace settings. And then other uh, considerations are, are blevies. So this is a boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. Um, these aren't too common, but I uh, still wanted to, to mention them. And essentially what happens is, is there's a complete rupturing of a vessel and it could be prevented by incorporating a sort of 
vent mechanism to let the vapors eject directly up into the atmosphere. And if the vapor isn't injected directly straight up, uh, the pressure vessel um, should be kept in an enclosure that will contain any explosion pressure and control the blast. So definitely if, you know, there's ever a situation where you see a uh, fire being emitted from a, from a tank uh, similar to this, uh, definitely keep your, your distance as the explosion could be um, very catastrophic. Now some storage fundamentals. And uh, aside from storage fundamentals, um, we see here on the first bullet, you know, we're looking at safety data sheets. So safety data sheets should always be our first point of reference when, you know, handling, storing, or using any type of chemicals or um, flammables or, or liquids. You know, we want to know what exactly are the dangers with uh, the material that we're working with. Um, what are the precautions that we should take in regards to, to managing and, and storing these uh, chemicals? And within the SDS, so this will let us know if it needs to be isolated from other materials, um, whether it can be stored in the same room as, as similar chemicals, or whether it should be stored uh, separate from, from certain chemicals. It will also list, uh, you know, uh, quantities and, and properties and uh, correct packaging for, for those chemicals. And some storing fundamentals. So we want to make sure that, you know, we're taking the proper precautions when when storing um, hazardous materials and uh, flammable liquids. So we want to make sure that, you know, they're not being stored in a way where they could be potentially blocking an exit uh, under stairways um, in places of, of egress. As you can imagine, if an emergency situation happens and these are, you know, placed at points of, you know, uh, evacuation, they could be tipped over or if the uh, evacuation is due to a, a fire and, you know, these liquids are, are stored in those spaces. Um, definitely can be some, you know, catastrophic situations that happen. I know something that um, can be seen, uh, you know, quite often sometimes is, you know, these being stored under under stairwells. So a lot of people, you know, see stairwell uh, not being in use and automatically go to, you know, storing um, flammables or or other equipment there that that shouldn't be there. And then with storing, so there are some limitations to quantities and of, of flammable liquids that, that we could store. And this is pulled straight from the Kalosha regulation. Um, as you can see, you know, no more than 25 gallons of flammable liquids should be stored in a room outside in a, of an approved storage cabinet. Storage practices, again, um, listing out some of the, you know, storage practices that are noted in the OSHA uh, requirements. So if it's greater than 120 gallons, uh, must be in containers, take 160 gallons in, in, in portable tank, and up to 25 gallons of, of extreme flammable liquids in, in approved storage rooms. And then looking at uh, storage cabinets. So this is where we want to, you know, store those uh, flammable liquids and containers, whether they're aerosols, whether there are um, five gallon uh, safety cans that, that we use to, you know, um, fuel uh, various equipment, you know, they should always be stored within those uh, flammable cabinets. And there are certain requirements to those flammable cabinets. So the doors should be self-closing. It should uh, be provided for, for grounding. It should have appropriate signage. And you know, sign should read flammable, keep fire away. And uh, the purpose of the storage cabinets, so the purpose isn't to, you know, prevent a fire from from happening due to the chemicals within the flammable cabinet. But the purpose is, um, in case a fire does happen outside of the flammable cabinet, to keep that fire from reaching inside and potentially causing an even an even greater uh, combustion or or flame from those chemicals inside the inside the flammable cabinet. Then looking at some of the requirements for safe, safety cans for, for transferring and storing of, of gas. So the, the lid for these should be uh, spring closed. Um, it should have a safety relief for internal pressure when exposed to fire. Now looking at some of the components within those storage cans. So they should have a, a flame arrestor screen as well. Sometimes they you know, could be compi co uh, composed of different materials, sometimes seen 
as a, a wire mesh, or it could be like a, a plastic or you know other type of material uh, mesh construction. And simply what that does, you know, it it prevents a a fire flashback into into contents from uh, releasing from from the container. And with compressed um, gases, uh, we want to make sure that you know these are stored properly. Um, again, looking at those SDSs of uh, the chemical where it can or can't be stored. And one big thing that will appear on the the next slide. So we want to make sure that that they're secured. So at two thirds um, from the from the the bottom up, we want to make sure that those uh, propane tanks are are secured either with some kind of strap or or chain um, secured to the wall. The picture on the left shows, uh, you know, proper storage of that where it's two thirds of the way up. Um, picture on the the right, as you can see, that's you know nearly towards the top. And the, the reason for that, in case um, you know any of them were to, to tip over, if uh, you know there was a, a crash nearby or an earthquake or something of that sort, to prevent those cans from from toppling over and getting banged up and possibly emitting the, the dangerous gas that's stored within that, that container. And then some other storage practices. Some of these are going to be very similar as well to storage practices for flammable liquids. We want to make sure that there's proper ventilation if they're being stored indoors. Um, out of the, the weather, you know, we want to avoid them being in, in direct sunlight or somewhere well where those cans will be you know, degraded due to, to severe weathering, which could um, uh, compromise the, the container and you know, lead to a, a risk of a possible leak or, or something of that sort. We want to make sure that there's good uh, housekeeping and also signage posted, uh, letting anybody know that, that those uh, cylinder containers are stored within a, a certain area. Also, when transferring, we want to avoid rolling these containers. We want to, you know, use dollies that are equipped for for transferring them. Um, for forklift use, when when refilling forklifts with uh, propane, we want to, you know, create a designated area where where that happens. Um, you know, separate and and away from from buildings. Um, have it, you know, be in its own location. Possibly also provide its own, you know, PPE within that that workstation since um, that gas uh, can, you know, um, cause frostbite or, or freeze burn. And also, you know, always making sure that we take the time to do the, the task that we're doing, not, not rushing through, through any of it, just uh, simply to, to get the job done um, faster. And now going over some safe handling fundamentals for flammable liquids. Again, you know, there's a little bit of crossover with these and with, uh, with, with gases. Um, again, you know, carefully reading the, those SDSs and making sure that we're familiar with uh, the chemical or, or liquid that, that we're handling before um, using, storing that, that chemical, uh, housekeeping, make sure that we're using good housekeeping, make sure we clean up spills immediately and uh, let any employees know of a, of a spill as soon as it happens, employees are working in the same area. Some other uh, key safety fundamentals, we want to make sure that, again, they're not stored in exits or, or passageways where they could be blocking a, an egress. We want to make sure that there's plenty of ventilation if they're stored indoors. And also keep these uh, liquids away from any uh, ignition sources such as open flame sparks, smoking, cutting, welding, or any high heat emitting activities. And before going on to the preventive measures, um, you know, we always want to take a look at the, the hierarchy of controls. So is there a way of um, eliminating the hazard, which is always the, the most effective? And then right down to the least effective is, is PPE. So simply donning, you know, gloves uh, or glasses, whatever that, that PPE is required for, for the chemical. Um, one example of this could be if our operations, you know, frequently use uh, forklifts. Is it possible to you know, eliminate a propane um, operated forklift for one that operates uh, through the use of uh, electrical battery. You know, is it 
you know, you got to weigh the, the pros and cons of, of the hazards with both as well. You know, and uh, a battery powered forklift, you know, isn't free of, of hazards. There's always hazards associated with the battery charging of, of that equipment. So always, you know, weighing out the, the different situations, uh, maybe uh, possible um, accident history uh, might be a, a way to, to look at the possible options as, as well to steer the direction in which we go into. And then substitution, so replacement of the hazard, is it necessary to use that flammable liquid or um, gas in the in the workplace? So this might be something that, a discussion that you could have with um, with procurement, you know, um, just looking at the different options for, for different um, substances and chemicals that, that they're purchasing within the um, organization or, or within the company. And then engineering controls, so isolating employees from from certain hazards or you know uh, using ventilation to remove uh, some of the the those gases or, or vapor that could uh, get concentrated within a, a certain facility and then administrative controls um, and and PPE at, at the end so looking at ventilation uh, as an engineering control so we want to make sure that storage rooms and rooms with storage cabinets are properly ventilated. Um, the the key here is if it's a room that is simply you know storing um, flammables and and uh, uh, storage cabinets and, and flammable liquids, um, gravity is an acceptable uh, method of uh, ventilation. But then if we're looking at at a room that is being used for the the transferring of liquids, so that's when we would need to have a a mechanical ventilation system in place. Other considerations would be oily waste um, cans, and we want to make sure that these are emptied out uh, every day at, at the end of each shift would probably be the most uh, reasonable or practical. And uh, the reason for this, you know, the reason for, for rags or, you know, any type of oily waste that has to be um, the reason for them being disposed of in these containers is for uh, spontaneous combustion. So, you know, if these oily rags or um, other oily materials are disposed of in a, in a regular um, trash or um, trash can, there's the, the hazard of, you know, a, a spontaneous combustion happening. But with these, um, if a combustion does, spontaneous combustion does happen, it'll keep it confined within the, the oily waste can. Now looking at um, you know grounding and bonding, and before I get into grounding and bonding um, as it relates to the transferring of, of liquids, um, you know we want to look at the reason why grounding and bonding is done. So the reason for grounding and bonding even taking place is due to the the fact that when there's a, a transferring of, of liquids you know from one container to the other, um, that transferring of liquid does um, generate static electricity. So we want to make sure that both containers are are grounded and and bonded um, to you know prevent those sparks from or prevent that static electricity from from sparking and igniting those uh, flammable uh, vapors being emitted from those two containers. And here's an example of what that grounding and bonding looks like. So you want to make sure that the the main container is grounded either through a, a grounding rod or um, through a, a wire that's then uh, clamped onto a, a, a grounding rod or, or, or a ground, um, a pipe that, that leads to the ground. And then subsequently, the container where we're transferring the you know liquids out of and into the, the smaller container. So we want to make sure that both of these containers are are bonded together. Therefore, you know both being grounded um, through that connection. And containers that need to be grounded and bonded, so that would be any category one, two, and some uh, category three flammable liquids. So you know all flammable liquids will will have to be grounded and bonded when when transferred. Um, combustible liquids those uh, aren't required for the standard. So that's where that's there's that crossover between uh, again category one, two, and category three flammable liquids and, and combustible liquids. Now looking at some examples of these, um, 
as you can see the picture on the left, the container being um, transferred into, it's a, it's a metal container. So everything looks fine and dandy here. And then on the picture on the right, so as you can see, we're you know, transferring onto a smaller glass container. And due to this container you know, being made out of glass, or well, you might think, well, hey, how am I going to, how, how am I going to, you know, bond or or ground a plastic or glass container? So simply inserting a, a grounding rod into that container, um, you know, that'll uh, meet the meet the requirement and meet the, the grounding and, and bonding requirement for for that different substance. Um, again, you know, going into housekeeping, so I can't stress the importance of housekeeping. Um, you know, this could be something that, you know, just depending on the, the facility, um, you know, the, the room or, or we're looking at, you know, making sure that housekeeping is done to identify, you know, potential flammable liquids or, or gases, um, you know, in, in any form that they are in. So this could be something, you know, if we're having uh, housekeeping issues in a certain area that has been identified to have some of these hazards. You know, maybe starting off with a, a weekly um, housekeeping schedule, and as housekeeping procedures get get better and and more routine, you know, then uh, you know we could uh, back off and maybe you know it turns into a monthly thing or, or quarterly. Um, you know, once these procedures uh, kind of become like like second nature, we practice to to the workers that that are, are working within um, this facility. Looking at other preventive measures, uh, we want to make sure that we mitigate any electrical hazards, um, you know, electrical hazards within these, these storage rooms can lead to a, you know, spark or potential source of ignition. So we want to make sure that, you know, any frayed um, wires are, you know, uh, covered and, uh, or any frayed wires are, are replaced, any worn frayed wires are replaced, any permanent conduit. Um, uh, as well, and uh, we want to make sure that all electrical equipment is grounded, and we want to install uh, GFCIs near any, um, you know, outlets that are near water or have the, the potential for water splashing on them. And we want to make sure we install safeguards. Uh, make sure also no um, sparking or smoking equipment is near these flammable liquids and, and hazards, and also um, perform regular maintenance to ensure that these hazards are, are mitigated. Other sources of ignition of ignition would be any sources uh, that emit uh, fire or temperature that could cause ignition, such as matches, smoking, uh, electrical equipment, static electricity. Some of these also include open flames, smoking, static electricity, cutting and welding, hot surfaces, electrical and mechanical sparks, lightning. So the the goal of this is. Um, any activity that you know deals with with this, um, where we see you know any activity that has the potential for for open flames or any of these hazards, you know we want to make sure that these activities are isolated, or the flammable uh, liquids or gases are are isolated from where these activities are are happening. You know we don't want to have these activities happening in you know very close proximity to um, flammable liquids and, and compostable liquids that could you know, um, possibly lead to a, a fire or, or an explosion. And then, um, you know, once all precautions have been taken, uh, measures we want to take well, um, it, for, for a program to, to mitigate any of these from happening would be make sure that we have a fire prevention program um, in, our, in our facility or, or in the workplace um, if work happens offsite making sure that we have fire prevention program for you know that that off-site work some of this includes um you know identifying the the hazards which is the the first thing you know we don't want to um just create a program not even know what the hazards are um the first step would be identifying these hazards and then from there we know what the the next step would be for you know the proper handling and storage procedures of of those hazards so simply you know doing an, an inventory of flammable liquids um, and gases. I'm looking at those SDSs, compiling them together, seeing what, um, you know, to see exactly what, what we're working with. And then once we have, you know, identified these, these hazards, 
we want to go and look at the you know measures of, of controlling and minimizing damage so looking at the emergency responses and fire uh, suppression systems to to be in place in, in case of an, an emergency and then you know how to respond and to to these um, fires or, or these events and also you know key um, uh, a big key for this anytime we're implementing a, a plan or program within the facility is once everything has been done and implemented, we want to make sure that you know there's proper training of employees, managers, and supervisors on on the plan. You know, there's really no point to um, taking you know all this time and and resource to create a plan and and you know just to simply have the plan and, and check it off our list. You know, we want to make sure that employees and you know affected personnel is trained on the plan so we know um, what the exact procedures are for for the plan. Again, looking at hazard identification of some of these hazards, so we want to, you know, make sure that the some of the hazard identification includes um, identification of flammables, uh, possible ignition sources, poor housekeeping, faulty electrical equipment, um, to name a few. You know, they, we shouldn't be um, just stuck in a box only looking for these. You know, also thinking outside the box and looking for other potential hazards that that could lead to to possible fires or or combustions. And then looking at the you know emergency response plan, once this has been implemented, we want to make sure that it's in it's in writing, it's been communicated, and it's been made available to employees. Again, um, training has been conducted on it. We want to also perform drills um, in case you know any of these uh, situations were to happen. We want to make sure that a drill is in place and and has been practiced. Looking at fire detection systems, so we want to make sure we have, you know, the, the proper fire detection systems located throughout the facility, especially, you know, in those rooms that contain those uh, combustibles or, or flammables. We want to make sure that there's backups as well. You know, we don't want to rely solely on, on one source. We also want to make sure that that maintenance and upkeep of, of these devices is, is done on a, on a regular basis as well. And then, you know, looking at sprinkler systems. So automatic sprinklers are one of the most effective ways in controlling and maintaining the, the spread of a fire. But the only way an automatic, an automatic uh, sprinkler system will go off is, you know, there's improper maintenance of, of that system. So we want to make sure that, you know, um, the, the company that, that we're contracting with for, for maintenance of those sprinklers, you know, are, are doing their job properly. We want to make sure that you know, we do have a, a you know, proper uh, vendor that is contracting and performing those, that maintenance and, and inspection of, of, that, of that equipment. And then there's a, there's a couple different um, types of, of sprinkler systems. We don't need to go into all of them, but I'll just quickly, you know, mention them. So there's wet pipe, dry pipe, uh, pre-action, deluge, and, and antifreeze as well. So we want to make sure that we choose the, the right system or the hazards and characteristic of our, our work site and uh, the hazards that are presented within um, that work site. Now looking into portable extinguishers, so we want to make sure that we're using the, the right type of extinguisher um, in the in the area that, that has these hazards. So this will you know tie into that hazard identification. So when, once we've identified the hazard, you know, we want to look at the, the hazard you did through the, the SDS, which would probably be the you know easiest way, and looking at um, procedures for for responding to, to fires due to that that chemical. Um, the sprinkler system here um, to the left, that's a H2O based sprinkler. This is something that you know wouldn't be, you know, you definitely do not want to use this in a liquid or, or combustible um, flammable hazard. Um, this will only, you know, uh, create the hazard, uh, make it bigger than than what it actually is. So the proper extinguisher for a flammable or combustible liquid uh, would be a, a Class B. Um, you know, oftentimes uh, we see uh, a Class A, B, C, or a Class B, C. So as long as it has that that Class B, 
um, that'll be you know able to, to combat that that um, flammable liquid exposure. Uh, but again, you know, always consult with the safety data sheet. We want to make sure that, that we have uh, the proper fire extinguisher for, for that situation. And that SDS sheet would also tell you, you know, which um, fire extinguishers you want to stay away from. So you want to make sure, you know, within that, that room or near that storage cabinet that we have the, the proper fire extinguishers and we eliminate any uh, fire extinguishers that could uh, potentially, you know, increase the risk of, of that fire or that combustion if, if you know, that would to, to happen. Okay, so here's that safety data sheet example I was just talking about. So again, this is pulled from the generic hand sanitizer, SDS that is in the, is in the handouts. So as you can see, um, it discusses firefighting measures for the, the generic hand sanitizer. Um, we want to use a, a CO2 based or, or dry chemical based fire extinguisher, and we want to avoid a, a water based um, fire extinguisher. And then looking at training, of course, you know, all employees that um, will be, you know, uh, potentially using a, a fire extinguisher must be properly trained to, to use um, said fire extinguisher. And then also within the training for the, the fire extinguisher, we want to make sure that, you know, employees know when to either fight or flee from the fire. So we want to, you know, the only times that an employee you know, it, properly trained um, would want to, you know, go in and try to fight the fires when the, the fire is within the, the starting stages, so the incipient stages. Um, it, always looking at the, the environment, if it's uh, only if it's, you know, safe to do so. Um, we don't want any any heroes, you know, trying to, to combat a fire and, um, you know, forbid uh, something uh, catastrophic could, could happen in, in that situation. So again, with um, you know identification of those hazards, we'll be able to see what um, fire extinguishers are to be used for for those areas, and equip those areas with with uh, the adequate and appropriate extinguishers. And then, um, as well with the uh, with the identification of the hazards, you know any employees that have been identified to to work with those hazards, um, employees either you know dealing with the uh, the charging of, of propane tanks, um, the transferring of liquids, all of those employees need to be trained on the, the hazards of flammable liquids and combustions and what to do in, in those situations. And then summarizing, you know, uh, some of what, what we've covered uh, through this presentation. So we always want to take preventative action and, and create a plan and train uh, the proper employees, um, the affected employees on that plan. We want to identify uh, specific hazards. So, you know, uh, starting off and, and looking at what we have in our facility, you know, taking inventory, looking at the SDS sheets for, for all of those chemicals. Also, you know, doing an inventory of, of our own um, SDS book or, you know, wherever we keep those, those SDSs and making sure that they're, you know, current and active. We want to make sure that, you know, proper disposal of flammables and explosive materials, um, you know, always using grounding and bonding when transferring flammable liquids when uh, they're within that category, either one, two, or three. Um, also looking at our written emergency response plan to include emergency responses to fires or explosions due to um, flammable liquids or gases. And also making sure that all staff are, are trained on the roles. So, you know, even if a, a staff member isn't, you know, working directly with these flammable or combustible liquids and, and gases, um, let's say it's uh, an employee with an administrative role, um, just making sure that they have involvement within the emergency response plan. So whether that's, um, you know, a, a drill, you know, making sure that they have involvement within that, that drill so they know what's happening. Whereas an employee who, you know, has more direct contact with that flammable liquid might have a more direct um, uh, roles within the, the emergency response plan. 
and again, you know, training staff and putting the, the plan in place and providing training and making sure that adequate um, uh, fire extinguishers are in place. All right, thank you. And um, that's it for me. Um, unless anybody has any questions, I'll be able to, to answer those right now. We did have one question that came in. Um, it is in regards to the butane cylinders, the ones that are used by the food and beverage chefs. Um, usually for desserts, um, they use those. The question is, what's the proper storage for those? Um, they found them lying in shelves with the igniter attached to it. So, um, Okay, so for those butane tanks, I mean, I wouldn't know the exact one that um, you're referencing to, but just, you know, looking at uh, some one of the things that we mentioned within the, um, within the, the webinar you know, is hazard identification. So that's good. You know, you identified that, hey, um, you know, this butane tank is probably not being stored properly. So the next step I would say is, you know, look at the, the SDS for, for that tank. So whether that means looking at, you know, the chemical or, or manufacturer uh, of that tank and just seeing the exact protocols for, for storing of, of said tank. Okay, and again, if you're using the small cylinders, the handheld ones, um, best to just keep what you need on hand um, as a best practice. Um, don't ex store excessive amounts in the kitchen area. Um, you know, as Ray said, keep it away from heat, from flame, that type of thing. Um, the proper storage cabinet would be the best place. So, okay, any other questions? I'll give you guys just a few minutes here to type away if something comes up. Um, our next presentation is January in the new year. It's the 13th. It's implementing a hazardous identification and assessment program. Mark Reinster will be presenting that. Um, again, that takes place January 13th. Our announcement will go out one week prior to our actual event. If you're not on our distribution list and you would like to be, you can always email us. The email address is on your screen now, the risk control at alliant.com. Um, the 2605042 number, you can call us at that as well and let us know how we can help you if you have any further questions or you want some more assistance with this topic that was discussed today. There are some handouts as well. You can go to the handout section and download the PowerPoint. There are a couple safety topics as well that we've included that are pertinent, as well as the SDS sheet that was the generic alcohol hand sanitizer um, information. And that's just an example to let you know the proper reading of an SDS sheet. Um, again, if you need more information on this, please reach out to us. We're happy to help you. Thanks for a great presentation, Ray. Um, very informative. I know there was a lot to cover today. Um, you'd think it was a short topic, but there's so much content just in, in flammable storage and mainly in liquid and, and gases. So, again, thanks for a great presentation. Please contact us if you need further assistance. Thanks so much.